This session is being recorded. Hello, and welcome to the American Psychological Association series on careers in applied psychology. I'm Dr. Betsy Schoenfeld, a university distinguished professor and an industrial organizational psychologist and performance psychologist at Western Kentucky University. I'm representing the APA Office of Applied Psychology, and I will be hosting this panel. Today, we have a very interesting panel on careers in occupational health psychology. We have six panelists representing different career paths in occupational health psychology. First, we have Dr. Chris Cunningham, the UC Foundation Professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, who will provide an overview of the field of occupational health psychology. Next, Emily Bellisteros, who's a stress management coach in private practice, will speak on a master's level practitioner career. Next, Dr. Liu Chen Yang, professor at Portland State University, will describe her career as a faculty member in the doctoral graduate program. Dr. Tim Bowerly, research behavioral scientist at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Spokane Mining Research Division, will speak on his career as a doctoral practitioner in occupational health psychology. Roxanne Lawrence is a doctoral graduate student at the University of South Florida. Roxanne will describe her role as a graduate student researching stress and emotional labor. Last and certainly not least, Dr. Alyssa McGonigal, Associate Professor of Psychology and Organizational Science at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, will describe her role as a faculty member in a doctoral graduate program. First, Chris Cunningham will provide an overview of the discipline of occupational health psychology. Chris? Thank you, Betsy, appreciate that. So you wanna learn a little bit about OHP is what I understand. And I think you've come to the right place. This is a really uh, excellent panel to give you the overview of what this field of applied psych is all about. The reason I'm gonna present the overview of OHP is that I'm currently serving as the president for the Society for Occupational Health Psychology, uh, but I've also been interested in this area of research and practice for a little more than 20 years now. So I'm just gonna give you a few slides to give you some background context for what we're talking about when we refer to OHP. That set of letters references occupational health psychology. And this really is uh, an area, as I said before, of research and practice where we're applying everything we know about how and why people think, do and feel and behave the way that they do. And we're putting this into play to protect and improve worker health, safety and well-being. One of the core beliefs guiding the work of OHP professionals is that wellness in workers is really more than just the absence of symptoms. And this, is, this corresponds really well with a, a model of health and well being put forth by the World Health Organization many years ago. In more recent times, OHP has become an invaluable component and uh, partner in transdisciplinary efforts to address what's being referred to as total worker health. And one of the points I just want to really drive home is that occupational health and safety interventions simply work better when there's help from psychological science. And one of the reasons for this, and, and you can go back to any number of theories in history of psychology, but one of the big ones here that always seems to rise to the surface is Bandura's model of triadic reciprocal causation and this notion that who we are and how we are influences what we do and that what we do impacts where we are in the environments and vice versa. And you can see with these double-headed arrows here that there's this, this deep level of relationship, interrelationship and influence. And when we're trying to tackle issues of health, safety and well-being at work, we really need to come at these matters from uh, a place of considering the person, the environment and the behaviors as all one complex set. Now, from an OHP perspective, what we're really talking about is creating and maintaining healthy and safe work. And if we're gonna do this well, that means we have to tackle environmental risks and exposures. We also have to uh, tackle social factors like group and team membership, uh, different unit structures, organizational arrangements, cultures, climates. And then of course there's psychological components operating within the individual and how these can actually aggregate and affect people in groups as well. Really when you stop and think about it, psychology is at the core of most worker health, safety and well-being matters because most of these issues are really intimately connected to how we perceive, appraise, feel about, react to, and behave in these various types of situations at work. So given all that deep level of relatedness, I think it's sometimes helpful to think about OHP as a bit of a lens 
uh, or even like a hub science or an amplifier, if you will, for so many of the efforts that are going on all around us in different disciplines and in different areas of work to try to help workers do well. When you really stop and think about it, there are ways to perform in groups and teams and in other work settings where we do focus more on protecting and promoting worker health, safety, and well-being. And so this graphic is simply meant to emphasize, again, that when we take what we understand about work as a place, as an environment, as an experience, we take what we understand about the theories and the research and the evidence on human behavior and functioning in organizational environments, we can actually go a long way toward protecting workers and making sure that work is giving back as much as it's taking away. So at a high level, OHP professionals tend to focus on prevention of the negative effects of workplace exposures, promotion of healthy personal and organizational actions and behaviors, and response to workplace exposures or crises that might occur uh, down the road. And, and you'll see the asterisk next to the first two, because really what we're trying to do, do is prevent situations from arising where some sort of clinical response is needed. Now, with that focus on those first two points, you might realize that a lot of the folks that do OHP-related work aren't necessarily going to have deep levels of training in clinical or counseling psychology. Many tend to be more focused on applied areas of psychology. But there's a place in this OHP domain for people with pretty much any kind of background in psychology to bring their expertise and skill set to bear. And you can see this again, too, if you look at some of the most common OHP topics that uh, folks in this discipline tend to focus on. The two big ones are work stress and how we recover from it, but also worker safety and how we protect it. And that's both psychological safety and physical safety. Uh, then, of course, related to some of these uh, main two topics are other sub-disciplines and areas of focus that include work and family and non-work management issues, uh, protecting worker psychological and physical health, creating sustaining healthy workplaces, uh, protecting workers from incivility, harassment, bullying, and other forms of mistreatment at work, uh, responding to uh, health and safety needs associated with an aging worker population, and also complexities that might arise when diversity is a factor in work settings. Um, helping to design workload pace and schedule arrangements that really do keep the workers' health and well-being in mind. Managing and responding to individual differences is also a huge area of focus in the OHB domain. And then increasingly, uh, a recognition and emphasis that many of the phenomena and challenges we struggle with are actually inherently multi-level. They don't just operate at the level of the individual worker, but they kind of span through work groups and up through organizations and some even into societal level forms of influence. And I'd just like to say, you know, as I wrap up this quick introduction, that if you're really interested in OHP, what you'll find is most OHP professionals are also members of really large organizations in psychology, like the American Psychological Association, but they also may be members of smaller uh, focus groups, like the Society for OHP. And so we often joke, we call each other OHPers a lot, and this is a group for folks like yourself if you're interested in learning more and being more of that professional community of OHP. I appreciate that chance, Betsy, to uh, do a little bit of introducing of the field, and I'm uh, really eager here now to hear the uh, perspectives of the rest of our panels. You're muted. Thank you for that overview, Chris. It was very informative, and I hope it's piqued your interest in careers in occupational health psychology, because we now have six panelists who will describe their careers in OHP. Next, we have Emily Ballesteros speaking on her career as a stress management coach. Thank you so much. So my name is Emily Ballesteros and I'm a stress management coach who focuses on burnout management in the workplace. I help busy employees or busy professionals create work-life balance. I very much focus on the wellness aspect within OHP. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about my background and how I got here. Um, we're starting very non-traditional here. So um, I started out as a nursing major and quickly realized that the human body is disgusting and I did not want to continue to do work in that area. Um, at the end of my freshman year, I switched majors and decided I wanted to still help people, but focus on psychology and business. Um, and so I went from my freshman or I went through undergrad and then ended up getting my master's in industrial organization, organizational psychology right afterwards. I chose a program that focused on wellness because I was particularly interested in that employee experience. That was, of course, um, spearheaded by a terrible uh, professional experience um, because you have to have some of those. And I recognize that there were so many employees in so many roles that 
probably woke up feeling just dread in their stomach going to these jobs. And I didn't understand how there weren't already solutions for it. So I started kind of weaseling my way through that career and went from um, a career in career advising to recruiting to working in HR and ultimately into training and development, which was the closest you could get to kind of endorsing wellness in the jobs that were available to me as somebody who was starting out early in their career. Um, and so what I ended up doing was burning myself out for two years, trying to maintain um, a semblance of balance and trying to create my own version of a solution to this workplace stress in the meantime. I was working full-time in corporate training and development. I was um, coaching part-time through an online platform. I was in graduate school full-time and I was commuting two to three hours a day on public transit. And I was experiencing a burnout by volume. And after two years of doing that, because I had a lot of faith in training, because I had was working in training and development at the time, I looked around for a solution and could not find one. Saw a huge gap in the market because I there was no shortage of burnt out professionals, and this was pre pandemic, so um, it was it's only grown in uh, prevalence since then. But I couldn't find a solution anywhere, and decided I would just create it myself. I hired a business coach and um, built out a program that would focus on alleviating the stress that employees felt from. From the employee's perspective. Um, the difference in what I do and what you might find in people who are in the uh, under the umbrella of uh, occupational health but are in consulting or training is that consulting and training are done typically um, in-house and you are utilized for a variety of problems that may come up. Whereas I knew I wanted to focus on one problem and just kind of be like a beacon or a lighthouse to attract people who were also struggling with that one thing. And that was experiencing burnout and high levels of stress at work. Um, and so I created a solution around that, a lot of market research that goes into creating a solution to a very specific problem is just asking the people who are actually having that problem. Um, there's not a lot of, as much guesswork as you would think there is. If you ask people what's wrong, they will tell you and they will tell you what they're looking for, what kind of solution they're looking for. Um, and I wanted that, that kind of uh, malleability in how I offered solutions. Um, whereas when you work under uh, a corporation, a lot of times they'll tell you how they need it to be delivered. So I did that. Um, I started with one-on-one -on -one coaching um, under that model and giving people solutions to the top areas of um, just alleviating that burnout that there were. That is time management, stress management, boundaries, personal care, and mindset. And those areas working in tandem um, come together to create that solution to burnout and alleviate some of that workplace stress. So I started out in one-on-one -on -one coaching as all uh, result yielding coaching models should, and then transitioned into more of group coaching and offering trainings uh, to a larger setting. And then from there, I have uh, kind of morphed into doing a lot more writing and getting to be in contact with people who are trying to get information on burnout now that it's not just some trendy descriptive term, um, it's something that most employees are struggling with. So that is the kind of non-traditional route I uh, took to get here. Got some notes to make sure I hit all of my major points. So excuse me as I kind of uh, glance down them. But um, I believe in a bottom up approach um, as opposed to just a top down approach. I think that there's so much work to be done inside of organizations, but it's very difficult as anybody who wants to um, enter the sphere of um, influence from inside an organization will uh, attest uh, to spend one hour with a group of people and hope that that trickles down to the rest of the organization. So I very much believe that you can do a lot of work when you um, address one person at a time and then let that kind of spread and do have a bottom up effect. Um, and that is the type of work that I have the great fortune of doing is just kind of approaching one employee at a time, whoever will listen, whoever I can corner, um, and then teaching them those, those uh, areas that I talked about that fall underneath that burnout management, stress management, employee wellness umbrella. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Luo Chin um, about her faculty member role in a doctoral graduate program. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is, I am Liu Ching Yang. It's my great pleasure to share with you all some of my career space as related to OHP. I'm a professor of industrial and organizational psychology, excuse me, and um, the director of 
a CDC NIOSH funded training program focused on OHP and total worker health at Portland State University. I'm also a member, of, member at large um, for the Society for Occupational Health Psychology, uh, working with Chris. And I'm a, although I'm an IO psychologist by training, uh, I've been mostly doing OHP work in the past couple of decades. Um, so my interest in stress management actually started when I was in high school, when uh, competitive exam performance was a key requirement for getting into any college back in China. I noticed that some of my highly intelligent friends can explain things really well in day-to-day -day setting, but would do really poorly at any stressful exam. So those observations led me to believe one's emotional and stress management skills are as important as or even more important than um, cognitive abilities in determining one's performance in uh, high stake stressful environments. Owing to that belief, I chose to major in psychology, got my bachelor's degree in general psychology and master's degree in IO psychology, um, both of which were from the Beijing Normal University, Beijing, China. Afterwards, I got my doctoral degree from the University of South Florida with the specializations in OHP and quantitative methods. Since then, I've been working as a system professor, then associate professor, and now full professor of applied psychology at Portland State University as a core member of the IO doctoral program, IO psychology, as well as the quantitative psychology doctoral program. Um, I've been so fortunate that I made those decisions for my career and I've been able to do work in the sphere of OHP uh, in the past couple of decades. After this, I will share a bit more about my research and apply the work. And then I will summarize with some um, quick insight on the OHP as a career. So my research and applied work is focused on what stress workers out and what keep workers engaged while being stressed out. Um, so specifically, my team uses evidence-based approaches, qualitative and quantitative methods to understand why and how work environmental factors uh, such as high workload and workers' personal factors such as uh, neuroticism um, can uh, stress workers out, hurt their well-being, and what we can do to engage workers uh, at work and to um, reduce workers' job strength, such as burnout, and, and to promote their health, safety, and well-being. For example, many of my research studies found that workplace mistreatment from supervisors or coworkers can have serious consequences for employees' health and safety outcomes, as well as their work productivity. Um, but fortunately, positive workplace climate and practices supporting worker well-being can um, actually prevent or reduce such mistreatment. Um, therefore, uh, really the, um, the whole OHP research and evidence can have significant impact on policies and organizational practices. Um, so the work populations I've worked with include, uh, but not limited to, workers in the healthcare, service, IT, and airline industries. And in my career to date, I have worked with colleagues in many disciplines, such as management, nursing, public health, and social work. In summary, I believe OHP is one of the most interesting and rewarding fields a psychologist can contribute to. It's multidisciplinary in nature, and it, for, it affords ample opportunities for uh, solving complex real-life problems with creative solutions. And the evidence from OHP research can have such significant impact on improving the work and the non-work lives of workers with very diverse backgrounds. Uh, in light of the current or well, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the benefits of OHP evidence for our workplaces and entire society have become more evident than ever. So I really encourage you to consider OHP as your future career. Thank you.
Thank you, Leo Chen. Next, we have Tim speaking about his role as a doctoral practitioner at NIOSH in the Spokane Mining Research Division. Okay, hello, thanks for joining me. Uh, my name is Tim Bowerly. I'm a research behavioral scientist with CDC NIOSH. And it's my pleasure today to talk to you about occupational health psychology. Uh, during my time in graduate school at uh, University of Connecticut, I worked with numerous high risk industries such as paper mills and manufacturing. But it was my work with Connecticut State Department of Corrections that really opened my eyes to the health and safety risks, which many workers face day in and day out that gets largely unnoticed by our technology based modern society. Uh, I remember conducting a study on correction officer stress and one worker said to me that on their best day, nothing happened going on to explain that on any given shift, his workday oscillated between complete boredom and life-threatening emergency. Uh, it was after that focus group that I developed a passion for improving the health and safety for high-risk occupations. In 2012, I accepted an internship in the NIOSH mining program and graduated from UConn with my psychology PhD in 2016 with concentrations in OHP and quantitative methods. I work for NIOSH, which is an institute inside of the CDC, and it's responsible for conducting research and making recommendations for the prevention of work-related injury and illness. Uh, I really enjoy working in the public sector. I see it as some kind of middle ground between academia and industry. The focus for my research doesn't necessarily need to be on publishing in a top tier journal or overly fixated on bottom lines and productivity. Uh, at the end of the day, I need to demonstrate that my research has impact and made a difference when it comes to the health and safety of the American workforce. I serve as a principal investigator of a project focused on sleep and fatigue in the US mining industry. Over on the right hand side, you can see some numbers which suggest that sleep and fatigue are potential health and safety issues in this industry. The US mining population on average works 10 more hours per week than the average US worker, and more than one sixth of US miners are working more than 60 hours per week. In safety sensitive occupations, which often require a fair amount of situation awareness around large earth moving equipment, this is potentially something to be concerned about. So in our study, we propose the development of a toolkit, which is like a resource repository for the industry that has the capacity to empower miners and mine management to use fatigue prevention strategies that better support their workers to be well rested and alert. Uh, in order to get there, we propose first identifying measures. Uh, fatigue is something called a latent factor construct, meaning that it cannot be directly measured, but only indirectly inferred. A skill set of occupational health psychologists is measurement of latent factor constructs that affect the health and safety of workers. Based on which measures of fatigue makes the most sense given the aspects of the fatigue construct itself, as well as a rugged mining environment, the next steps are development, deployment, and evaluation of different intervention strategies that can appropriately mitigate or control the risk of sleepiness and fatigue, which will contribute to the tools included in the toolkit. Because our focus is on improving health and safety among the US mining population, our outputs might look a little different than academia or industry folks. NIOSH places a large emphasis on the publication of our work to ensure high quality science and that our conclusions and methods can hold up to the peer review process. Uh, of course, one of the problems here is that miners rarely read peer review journals. So we often need to get creative in our health and safety communications. Here's an infographic we developed as part of the fatigue project that lists top 10 sleep tips for miners, something that we hope can be shared during toolbox talks and safety briefings. Finally, here's a little known fact for you. Miners really like stickers. It's not uncommon to see miners talking about rare stickers they've collected over the years that are out of publication. And when you see miners getting stickers at a mining convention, they'll usually ask for two, one to put on their hard hat and one to keep for their collection. Here's a sticker that we've designed to get the word out about our project and the importance of sleep in addressing fatigue. While stickers aren't usually the first tool we think about when it comes to imparting real change in the health and safety of workers, I enjoy the fact that we get to think creatively about how to craft and send messages using unconventional health communication mediums to improve the lives of our target audience. Thank you so much for your time and attention and your interest in occupational health psychology. I hope that you're consider a career an occupational health psychology career in the public sector. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I really love that sticker. Um, 
appreciate your work you're doing. Our next presenter is Roxanne Lawrence, who will speak on her current career as a doctoral graduate student at the University of South Florida. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Roxanne Lawrence. I am a fourth year doctoral student in the uh, IO psychology, that is industrial and organizational psychology uh, PhD program at the University of South Florida. Um, I do have a concentration in occupational health psychology. And so I'll be speaking to you today just a little bit about uh, some of the research that I do um, as a uh, graduate student. So um, the research that I look at generally focuses on um, how or factors that really contribute to the reduce the well-being of our workers um, and also how we can help to overcome these factors. Particularly, my uh, interest is in emotion suppression, that is um, minimizing or hiding your felt emotions. And um, we all suppress our emotions, right? Take, for example, um, you may have a contact with somebody that um, really upsets you and you just really want to say something that something to them but you hold your tongue because you, and you smile because you don't want to say something that you will regret later and I'm um, just taking this to the work environment imagine um, in the customer service industry where um, this idea of service with a smile is uh, a part of your role so you might have a service worker, maybe a barista um, at Starbucks, maybe, um, and uh, they have to deal with a really, really bad customer and uh, they really want to say something. They have something to say, but um, they can't. Right. They have to suppress their emotions, you know, hold back because it's their responsibility, their role to treat your customers well and serve with a smile. So although we know that emotion regulation is um, a necessary part of life. Life. Um, it helps us to navigate our work environment. We do know um, that this excessive or constant regulation of our emotions or suppressing our emotions can be um, detrimental. It can be um, it can be associated with anxiety, depression, low job satisfaction, and all that such stuff. And so um, we want to figure out how do we help our workers, um, workers or individuals who just um, who must you know regulate their emotions. And so my research really looks at uh, cross-cultural values and how that helps to uh, reduce the negative effects of suppression. Um, and the reason I'm interested in cross-cultural is because after undergraduate, I got the opportunity through the Fulbright Scholarship to live in Japan for 10 months and do research. And because of that, I was exposed to um, actual real-life cultural differences and how um, my society, I'm Jamaican by birth, but um, um, Jamaican society, the U.S. society, and the Japan, um, Japanese society are different. So I really got interested in um, cross-cultural differences there. And so um, I wanted to look at how cross-cultural values, differences in that, helps to reduce the negative effects of um, of suppression. Uh, and so uh, my study looked at collectivism, which is this emphasis on, um, you know, uh, group values or putting group values above your own and togetherness and um, emphasizing family and group relationships. And so um, across literature, we find that individuals with this collectivistic value set, they tend to not um, show these negative emotions or these negative outcomes when they suppress. And so um, my research went goes ahead and I looked into this and I'm like, okay, well, suppression, when you suppress your emotion, you feel this tension, right? Because what you feel and what you're expressing is not in alignment. So my research actually finds that um, individuals who endorse this sense of um, togetherness, a sense of um, family and group relationship and emphasis on belonging, when they suppress their emotions, they don't, they actually really don't feel um, this high level of um, the negative well-being or anxiety. Um, and they, as a matter of fact, when they suppress their emotions, it actually increases good well-being, well-being right um, and hypothesis is that um, well these individuals um, when they suppress their emotions they're actually um, it's not conflicting with their goals if their goals is um, are to just be um, together with the group for maintaining group harmony and group meaning your workforce um, then that is actually aligns with their values and that is why you're not seeing this um, this negative decrease in in well-being and so that's that's 
that, right? Adjusting our values or incorporating things like, um, you know, feelings of togetherness or um, family orientation or valuing um, senses of belonging. Those things can help our workers um, to reduce the negative um, impact of um, suppression on well-being. So I hope um, you're able to use things that you enjoy, like cross-cultural um, relations for me, incorporate that into what you study and um, join us in being uh, workers or uh, in the OHP sector. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Very interesting research. Thank you. Next, Alyssa McGonigal will speak on her role as a faculty member in the University of North Carolina Charlotte doctoral program. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Alyssa McGonigal and I am an associate professor of psychological science and organizational science at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Very happy to be speaking with you today. I completed a PhD in industrial organizational psychology with a concentration in occupational health psychology about 10 years ago. And during my graduate training, I took many classes in occupational health psychology, and I worked on research and consulting projects related to worker physical safety on the job in particular. Um, so for example, I worked to help identify work-related factors that contributed to workplace injuries in grocery store workers as one of those jobs. And this involved working with the organization to collect survey data from employees and link that survey data to data that the organization also had on injuries. Um, and through that, we were able to develop some insights to share with the organization and also create um, a research publication out of it. So um, since obtaining my PhD, I have worked as a faculty member at two different universities where I have taught classes related to occupational health psychology. And so I've taught those classes at the undergraduate level, the master's level, and also the PhD level. Um, I have also mentored undergraduate students and graduate students who are interested in OHP research and conducted my own research studies related to worker health, safety, and well being. My current research program focuses on workers with chronic health conditions. And so by chronic health condition, I'm referring to both physical and mental health conditions or uh, illnesses, um, along with chronic symptoms like chronic pain or chronic fatigue that may affect workers. And I study challenges that these workers with chronic health conditions may experience while working. Um, these could include, for example, conflicts between work and health management, um, such that work uh, time spent at work may prevent someone from managing their health condition in a way that works best for them. Uh, other challenges may include facing discrimination at work based on chronic health condition, um, attaining any needed accommodations, disability related accommodations for a chronic health condition um, or managing symptoms effectively while working. I also study interventions to help these workers maintain workability and well-being. So for example, I conducted a study of coaching to help improve workers levels of personal internal resources that can help them manage better on the job. This would be called an individual intervention um, because it focuses on the individual with the health condition as opposed to the organization at large. At this point in my career, I am moving toward doing more interventions at the organization level. Um, so that would inv involve changing aspects of work to help people with chronic health conditions work in a healthy way and manage their health condition optimally. To that end, I'm currently conducting a study where I'm interviewing managers and human resource professionals about how organizations can better support workers with chronic health issues. And I also recently submitted a grant proposal to look at work-related factors that lead to work health management interference and diabetes self-management in workers with type two diabetes that are in blue collar and service type positions. I'm about to start writing a book on these topics as part of an occupational health psychology book series as well. Um, the book will be titled Chronic Health Conditions in the Workplace, Challenges and Supporting Workers. 
Beyond research and teaching, I am also currently the secretary treasurer for the Society for Occupational Health Psychology, or SOHP, that Chris mentioned earlier on. In that role, I help schedule meetings and take notes and maintain the finances of the society. Um, finally, I am also a member of the Healthy Work Design Committee for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. In that role, I help NIOSH identify areas to prioritize in terms of research and intervention to promote worker health and well being through work design. So, for example, how work is set up, um, how flexible is it, how much control do workers have? Um, so that is my job in a nutshell. As you can see, I do many different things, and I think that's uh, one of the wonderful things about a career in occupational health psychology. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Okay. Now I'll ask Chris to describe his role as an applied researcher and consultant linked to a master's graduate program and a college of medicine. Yeah, I appreciate that, Betsy. And, and as you've heard from the other panelists, you know, there's a lot of ways you can take that interest and passion for OHP and put it to good use. In my case, I am the uh, graduate program director for a master's of science terminal master's degree program in IO psych, that's industrial and organizational psychology. And I'm also connected to a uh, local college of medicine. And as a result, a lot of the work that I've been doing for the past uh, 15 years or so has been focusing on translating what we understand about OHP to helping to prevent uh, occupational health issues in a medical workforce, so nurses and physicians and other staff members. Um, over the time, I've also become really fascinated in the way that work more generally affects us. You know, sometimes we tend to focus so much on how work is bad for us, but work also does a lot of good things for us too. It, gives us a sense of purpose, it meets our needs, it gives a sense of meaning. Um, so I've been really looking at that over the years. Uh, given where I live in Chattanooga, there's also a very strong religious presence in this area of the country. And so I've also been really fascinated with the influence of a person's religion and spirituality and how that serves as an individual difference that affects our health and well-being in and out of work. And then I've also become very fascinated in not so much the stress management side, but more the recovery management side, what we're doing essentially to prepare ourselves to be ready for work every day, to give our very best. Now, all that is a natural outgrowth for me because I don't train researchers, I train practitioners. The majority of graduate students go through my program become human resource managers and, and talent management professionals. And as a result, we're constantly trying to translate what we know about the science of human behavior at work and put it to good use. So the challenges are always, how do we make this business relevant? How do we how do we protect these workers so they can continue to create value for the organization, but also how do we create organizational realities for people that are positive and uplifting and, and really can help people kind of manage an entire career. Now, in some ways, I think um, there are a variety of domains that uh, we have yet to serve better. Um, I think, you know, one of the other growth areas in our region of the country has also been manufacturing. And so we're seeing a major growth and in interest in creating safe spaces in that domain, but we also see an increasing need and interest in focusing these efforts into the education domain, for instance. That's an area where we haven't done perhaps as much as we still need to. So I just wanna stress that because there's all kinds of domains that have, we barely scratched the surface on. And if you find any of these principles interesting, there's all kinds of areas for you to go in there and make a difference. Now, one thing we, we didn't really talk a whole lot about yet is, is how you can go about going down this pathway. And you might've noticed if you were listening really closely to the different presentations that we all have some connection to IO psychology. And just to reiterate what you heard a couple of us mention, that, that stands for industrial and organizational psychology. Uh, it may be the worst name for a subdiscipline of psychology because it's so darn complicated. And that's why we abbreviate it. Um, but you can, you can find that in the IO psychology programs, there are ways to specialize and a lot of different aspects of human performance, human selection, training and development, placement, retention, all the things that you know, companies might care about with their workers. What you will also find if, if you dig a little more deeply into those training options though, is that there's a handful of programs out there that have specialized in offering uh, doctoral and or master's level training in occupational health psychology. One of the best places to find information about what these programs are is through the uh, graduate training uh, information portals that you can find at the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology's website. That's siop.org. 
That's Division 14 of the American Psychological Association. Uh, and also the SOHP website that I shared in my slides earlier. On both sites, there are searchable listings of graduate programs that will allow you to see areas of specialization and also allow you to track down opportunities to be trained in this discipline. One other general tip I would just also offer, um, as you start to learn more about ways that you can take your interest in psychology and put it to good use, start reading. And as you read stuff by professionals out there doing it, if you like what you're seeing or you see an article that was published somewhere and it quoted this person that you thought was just so cool, so interesting, track them down, find out where they work. Chances are, if they're doing that kind of work at that particular program, then that's a program that is offering training opportunities in an OHP arena. And uh, it's, it's a growing field, it's an increasing uh, presence out there. So the good news is there's never been a better time to pursue training in this area. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, like right now. Now, I'd like to ask even each of our panelists for one final comment, perhaps what you wish you knew before grad school or some other helpful insight. Emily, you wanna start us off? Absolutely. Something that I wished I had repeated to myself every day going through my schooling and into my career was to work hard, but not take yourself too seriously. You can rob yourself of enjoying any of your experience if you just treat life like a performance um, and to follow your interests. Life is not that serious. Follow your interests so that you actually stay engaged in the life you wake up to every day. Thank you, Emily. Hey, Al Chen. Hi, um, thank you. Emily and uh, Betsy, I would say uh, one thing I wish I knew before going to grad school was that um, being in a specialized psychology field like OHP and IO psychology would uh, involve so much technical and practical writings than one would expect in social any social science field. Um, so, because I got into psychology as part of the science track, I was thinking, okay, great, so I can do this database, you know, <laughs> research and evidence, but um, I would uh, wish a lot of folks can do more writing, the communication is so important, like blogging or technical writing will be great for OHP field. Thank you, Leo Chen. Tim. No matter where uh, your skill sets lie, there's a place for you in uh, OHP. It's such a big tent that involves a, a lot of um, multidisciplinary uh, interconnecting moving parts that there, there is a place for you. Just acknowledge your own limitations, ask questions that uh, you don't know the answer to, admit where the gaps in your knowledge are, and you'll go far. Thank you, Tim. Roxanne. Uh, so my last, my tip is to live one day at a time. Um, grad school can seem like a lot <laughs> all happening at once, but one day at a time, you do what you have to do and, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, go to, a, if you're choosing what schools you want to go to, be someplace where you actually like the environment. Like you'll be there for five years if you're doing a PhD program. Like, do you love the sun? Do you love the warmth? That's for me. I love that. If I was at someplace else, I couldn't function. So um, live one day at a time, take care of yourself and understand that you are growing and you're not going to be able to get everything correct. Um, um, immediately, but that's the fun of learning. Thank you, Roxanne. Alyssa? Yeah, I love all of the advice given so far. I'll just add that your network, so who you have relationships with, is very important. And I think it's easy to get bogged down in coursework, research, teaching, um, all of the stuff that goes along with graduate school um, and undergrad. So don't neglect your work-related social life, I would say. Build relationships with other students in your school and other schools and actively work to meet people at conferences. Thank you, Alyssa. Chris? Yeah, really phenomenal feedback here. And I would just, just add a couple of quick things. In addition to what Roxanne said, you know, where the graduate training is is important, but who you're going to be training with, um, mm -hmm. sort of echoing some of what Alyssa said, it's, it's the people that you're going to spend the time with, you're going to work hard with, you're going to laugh with, you might cry with a little bit, and then hopefully your career is going to develop with their help. And but also extending off of Alyssa's comments, you know, um, none of the occupational health challenges that we discussed today can be resolved by one person or even one discipline. 
So learning how to uh, work collaboratively with other professionals who have other areas of training, learning how to realize that it really does take a village, you know, to, to correct some of these issues and to fix some of these issues. This is a pretty exciting field to get into, especially if you like relating well with others and, and you like working collaboratively with others on difficult challenges. Thank you, Chris. In closing, I would like to thank each of our panelists for sharing their careers in occupational health psychology. What an exciting array of careers and what a breadth of opportunities in occupational health psychology. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentations as much as I have. If you would like to learn more about a career in occupational health psychology, contact us. Visit the APA Office of Applied Psychology and or the Society for Occupational Health Psychology. At this SOHP website, you'll find a wealth of information on occupational health psychology, as well as graduate school opportunities. At the APA Office of Applied Psychology website, you'll find information on other careers in applied psychology, including industrial organizational psychology. Goodbye and good luck pursuing your career in applied psychology. <laughs>